Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Okay, Hi, guys. neighbor. Hi there. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I, I am doing just fine, thanks. This is going to be an interesting jaunt. This is our first, first social distancing podcast. Happy to be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you for putting the mic on that was disinfected at the front door. We'll do the same when we leave. This is an educational process, yep. I think. Can we come on back with you? Come on back. Great. Well, I will follow. My name is Nicole Lemo, and I live here in Claremont, San Diego. Um, born and raised in San Diego. Born here. And I'm Alara's neighbor. Yes, <laughs> Right across are. the street. Yes, you are. <laughs> This is like the Between Two Ferns show, except this, we're between what looks like a bunch of radishes and some Swiss chard. Is that right? That is absolutely correct. Yes. Between, Good eye. <laughs> between bunches of Swiss chard. I kind of like That has a ring. There's, there's lots the chard. of little tiny sections in this garden. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we were just we were just talking about the benefits of gardening and how you garden all the time. Is this just for food for you? Um, it it started as mostly just experimentation, actually. Yeah. Um, I grew up around a lot of plants, and I mean, eight years ago was very different from where I am today. So I moved in here about eight years ago, across no, the street from you. That can't be it's right. It's been eight years, <laughs> um, and just every year, how things are changing too. So. I grew up around plants, as I mentioned, um, but you know, my family, we had a, a garden, not every year, just seldom. My mom would plant a garden, and I, I don't really know where I got all this from, but um, I like diversity, and I like experimenting, and I like um, kind of tracking trends over time and data, so this is kind of um, lots of experiments for me. Yeah, you're um, a finance girl, which is right up my alley. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> lots of numbers and, soil. and data. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it's, it started out um, earlier on as a lot of um, uh, drought tolerant and low water maintenance type of items. So, um, I mean, you can take a look at the front yard as well, but that is completely drought tolerant. And I think I've watered that front yard maybe once a year, but otherwise it's completely self-sufficient with just whatever rainfall we get in California. And I don't even use um, whatever water I get from rain barrels. So that's just all drought tolerant. And then back here, has kind of, um, it has some succulents as well, but um, you know, I'm kind of redoing this, this plot now, but a lot of it has started to grow into what I can eat at this point. And that's kind of been um, the last five years I kind of started that. So planting fruit trees, um, the avocado and the olive was about five years ago, but now it's, it's getting a lot more into vegetables and what I can eat and then what I can share with others too. Now I'm looking back here and I know that this is half the greenery that you had a year or two ago. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which is, I, the, your garden is always in transition, which is, kind of goes with the seasons. Yes. Gardens are in transition all the time. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, and you know, I have two different garden types. So in the last year, um, just with, with changes in um, the economy, um, changes in you know, individual people's financial status, um, I've kind of been going a different route and I'd like to show you guys that in a little bit as well. But so this, this side of my yard, and we'll walk around here as well, this side of my yard is still my space. It's my experimenting space. It's my um, space to kind of go a bit crazy. And I mean, as you can see, it is a bit crazy, but then there's another part of my yard which is more, um, kind of reserved and a bit more thoughtful. Um, so it's still a place to enjoy the outside. Um, it's a bit more peaceful. So this is a little bit crazy for some, I will admit that. No, no, you're making my marriage look good here, I'm telling you, because my husband's thinking, why are you doing the experiments? But I'll just send him over here if he needs to have an example of how it could get. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do it with, so with compost and you do it with plants. Exactly. Yes. But there's another side of the yard that is um, kind of what I'm kind of calling more geared towards um, a more kind of relaxed atmosphere. 
Um, so there's a space for relaxing and then there's still um, gardens and there's two fruit trees over there. So just a little bit of change in what people could possibly be doing with their yard space. Um, and then just given the amount of time they have and then what they personally like. So this is a, a lot of maintenance for some people, um, for me too at times, but, um, and it's, it's just a lot going on, but um, you know, there's, there's so many different options and you can make gardening work for whoever you are, whatever amount of time you have, as much as you want to put into it. So there's just, there's something for everyone. But you, it's not just <clears throat> the, about the gardening process, it seems, because you, uh, you are in good shape. You, you, you can go all weekend long and you're still <laughs> out there with your tush in the air digging in the dirt somewhere. You go yeah. all weekend long. So this is great exercise. This is great exercise. And I was thinking a lot about it later. For me, I, I work in an office. Um, a lot of other people, you know, um, are manufacturing people. So they're still in a building or, hey, you're driving Uber or you're driving a Lyft. I mean, so you're in a car. So you still might be outside, but you're still, you know, confined to s sitting. Um, so for this, for me at least, sitting in an office most of the day and in a building, it's a good way to get outside to enjoy whatever weather's going on um, and kind of get outside in just the fresh air and clear your mind a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now you are in a very structured, uh, you have very structured training in your job life. Yeah. It's like me in finance and tax and accounting. It's, it's ledgers and lines and things fit. Yeah. You know, debits equal credits. That's just the way of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really appeals to me about gardening is I don't always understand how the debit and credit works, but it always works. Yeah. <laughs> it's always, if the soil is healthy yes. and has the nutrients, usually the plants will grow. And yeah. if they do not, it's because it came from another part of the ledger. There was something that was missing, either sun or yep. water or something. Yes. Does that appeal to you in gardening? Well, so I'm an economist by my education. Um, so lots of economics and everything. So my whole thing is balance. Um, and so I find a lot of, if something's not working, then it's because of an imbalance in something. Um, and so generally, you know, a lot of what I do is look at soil and bugs as well. And you can see how well your plants are growing and you can see what the, the, um, the bug life is inside of your soil to see how healthy everything is. Um, I'm not the best at all when it comes to soil development and maintaining healthy soil. <laughs> I, as but, I look around, you're <laughs> saying that. I think that's not true, but. But it's, it's getting there. It's on my to-do list this year of learn more about my soil, but um, you know, you can really see what's working and what isn't. Um, you can see how things, um, you know, there's, this is in a constant state of flux. So there's plenty of plants that have um, died over the past eight years here. And so it's all about learning what plant likes it best where, and that could be based on certain sun, um, or it likes more water, it likes more shade, it likes a different type of soil patch that is around here in the Claremont neighborhood. Um, so it's all just about moving things around and seeing what works best a lot yeah. of the time. Yeah, so you could have things that work great in one place because they like heavy soils or clay or they want high nutrients or yep. something of that nature. You just plant a different plant there. That's exactly. Sort of the permaculture methodology, isn't it? Exactly. Everything in the right place. Well, I'm looking at your, am I looking at the lemon tree in the back? That's the lime back there. I have one contact lens in, so I, some things are a little <laughs> iffy over here. But, but that it looks incredibly healthy to me. And, and again, you can tell balance or not because that tree will tell you if the leaves turn yellow you mm -hmm. might have a magnesium deficiency, but it's yep. only if they turn yellow in a certain way. If they have <laughs> veins that are green and leaf that's yellow, it might be something else, correct? Absolutely. So it's observational. So do you find that in terms of the quantifying of the imbalances, you depend on the sciences like a soil test kit, or do you kind of just know by this time? Um, for seven and a half years of my eight years here, it's just been uh, just personal experience and kind of talking with other neighbors, such as yourself, as to what is growing well in our yards in this community. Um, only late last year did I actually buy a pH testing kit, and that's only been within the last, you know, six months or so that I've been, you know, testing out different spots in my yard. Um, I need to do a lot more research on, on that as well and how I can improve or change the pH balance. Um, but for the most part, the majority of this time has just been trying things out and um, just observation, seeing what works and what doesn't work. Now, they, I, I don't know if you found this. Well, actually, I do know because you and I have talked about this over the last couple of years. 
we don't need something else to tell us that the climate is changing, the globe is changing because the garden tells it to us. I've yes. lost three <laughs> trees for I don't know what reason yeah. in my yard in the last couple of years and everything yeah. seemed to be perfect, but they just did not like whatever was happening, whether yeah. it was heat tolerances or fertilizer or what. Do you find that's the case? Uh, same, exact same. And it, it's interesting to watch things year over year. Um, plants or trees that I have, just like you, that have been healthy here for five years, six years. Just this year, I've been losing a couple trees. Um, you know, I lost one in the front yard. I've lost um, another tree to some other pests as well. And it's just uh, gophers, uh, some ground termites, you know, things that you don't really see much of in years past. And now all of a sudden you're seeing something completely different and new for this area. And it, it takes out some of the local, local produce, uh, the fruits and the, the vegetable trees here. So yeah, you can definitely tell just by looking at what is happening and kind of plotting things or remembering things year over year. Um, you know, I'll take note of year over year, how much rain we're getting and when we're getting it. Um, and then I can judge by the amount of, of what's growing in my yard, um, just how rainfall is affecting my yard. Um, there's certain pest years. This is a very bizarre pest year for me, as we've talked about. Last year was and the year before it's, was as well for me. It, it's just, it's the most bizarre thing and things that I've never encountered before too. And so a lot of that is just uh, talking with your neighbors, talking with your local nurseries, um, lots of online searches as well as to, you know, here's a new problem. What is it? Where is it coming from? What are organic, natural ways to treat some of these problems, if at all possible? Um, and then, I mean, absolute worst case, and it's, it's some of the saddest times on the weekends for me, is, you know, if it, you have to take out that, that tree. And that's happened quite a few times this year, unfortunately. Yeah. But, but yeah. yeah, things are changing. Um, and yeah. we just have to adjust. But. Yeah. I, well, okay, now, sp speaking of things changing, mm -hmm. we are dealing with the COVID-19 outbreak right now and the pandemics that are going around. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden food is a big concept to people and they're saying, ooh, let me go garden. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I hope that's <laughs> what they're saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would be curious if you think that this is gonna be a trend or if people are really gonna start to appreciate the fact that food that comes out of the garden is good. It's partly yeah. the effort. Mm -hmm. It's partly the fact that I grew that. Mm -hmm. I, look at that piece of lettuce. Like I'm looking at your gorgeous chard here. Mm -hmm. If a kid goes to the garden and says, I grew that chard, is he more likely to eat it because he knows what it take, took to make it, even if it doesn't taste quite the way he thought before? I would hope so. Yeah. I truly do hope so. Um, I hope that this is just a time of people have been so busy, um, you know, trying to provide for their families, um, trying to kind of get ahead in life. Um, and this is, you know, one kind of silver lining is we get to be at home with our families. We get to be at home and kind of regroup. Um, and then just take some quiet time and kind of reflect on what's around us. And I mean, for me at least, all this is so special. It's so amazing that all of this can grow with, I mean, relatively little input. Um, and so it's just even more rewarding if I can go out to my backyard and pick something that, that I grew or, you know, share it with my neighbors and you and I exchange things all the time. So, you know, I, I, I really do love that aspect. Um, I would hope that other families are are kind of looking to that as well, especially as things are getting shorter um, and out of stock at our grocery stores. Um, you know, you go in and there's not much produce on the shelves and all of this stuff is packed with so many vitamins and nutrients that we need. Um, and I mean, at least all my stuff, and I know all of yours is, is chemical free, pesticide free, completely organic. Um, all there is is some fertilizer on a few things, but so it's just, it's local, you know, it was literally picked a half an hour ago and it's I hope families start to to get into that and especially with their kids if they have kids it's such a wonderful thing to be gardening with your family watch it grow over time and then serve it and cook it for a, a family dinner or or lunch so I hope so yeah I I, okay. I still remember when I was probably in sixth grade the mm -hmm. moment we were standing outside in my my folks backyard mm -hmm. we had this old Santa Rosa plum and my dad had Santa Rosa and Satsumas. That was his perfect San Diego mix. Gorgeous. I don't know if everybody knows that, but that's a big purple, gorgeous purple plum. It's beautiful. And I still remember that moment standing in the yard with the sun beating on me, tasting that plum. There's something about picking yep. something out of the garden or off the tree and tasting it. It is so much more poignant. Especially in our beautiful weather too. It's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Just how much sweeter things taste. Um, 
they just have such a richness to them. Even, you know, rooty vegetables like beets or carrots. It's just, there's this sweet, wonderful taste about those things. So it, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah, I agree. So <laughs> we talked about the, the benefits of gardening and the victory garden concept is one that's really interesting that's coming back now that everybody's getting wiggy about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But the Victory Garden concept was, was, it became famous during the World Wars as a way to increase stability, but also they talked about it increasing morale. And I think George Washington Carver also talked about this. Mm -hmm. As a morale booster, you are producing your own food. Mm -hmm. But there is also something about going into the yard and saying, I grew that. Yeah. And also yeah. the taste of the thing and the benefit from being outside. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing uh, conglomeration of, mu of many benefits when you, it's not just yeah. food anymore. Absolutely. The, the other part, I mean, we kind of segue just a little bit, but it's related. You'll notice there's a, so there is a lot of craziness and a lot of um, overgrowth in this yard, but a lot of the things have flowers on them. I call it abundance. I call, call it abundance, abundance too, but <laughs> <laughs> people have different names for this. <laughs> So there are a lot of things growing in this yard that have flowers on them and dandelions are a big one too. So I tend to leave those growing as well. They are edible. Um, you can make a lot of different things out of dandelions, but the biggest one to add on to what you were just saying is also the bees. So the bees and our pollinators, we have, um, there's lots of uh, hummingbirds that live in this yard. There's a lot of bees. I get the butterflies coming through a lot too, but all of those things are pollinating all of our food. And so if we're making this place for those to come, um, it's just, it's creating that balance worldwide again, too, so. Yeah, and in California, we, I think we grow something like 80% of the world's almond crop. Yes. It's not just a touchy-feely thing that you keep the bees here. That makes it possible. So yes. this is not just a, oh, save the bees because it's a nice thing and don't use chemicals. It's because if you want to enjoy almonds, you better make sure those still exist. Absolutely. And San yep. Diego, many people don't know, San Diego is huge for, uh, for bees mm -hmm. and wild bees. Mm -hmm. It's a huge area, and, and and to me, I think that's one of the reasons why our crops produce like they do. Absolutely. I think yeah. you've called me about three times over the past couple of years of, hey, there's a swarm, do you want one? <laughs> <laughs> well, this is also a benefit. I'm looking at all these, uh, is it radishes or turnips that I'm looking these at? These are rat-tailed radishes. Okay. So, um, and it, actually the radish is on the, these stems, so it's not in the ground. It's actually, this, this part right here is it. Um, that's the edible part. That's the edible part. And um, they're actually, they have a very tangy, uh, spicy taste to them. So the larger they are, the more kind of spicy they are as well. The smaller ones um, are a bit more mild and easier for most, including myself, to, to eat. Um, I've tried pickling them for a couple years, so I, um, they're good pickled. And then the smaller ones I like on salads to kind of spice up. Um, I know I've been reading some Asian cultures like to um, saute them or stir fry them. Um, so with noodles or rice and then a meat, but um, there's a lot of them. <laughs> well, I was just thinking that you were letting these go to seed to, to seed to collect the seeds on them, which I'm assuming you do save some of your own seeds. I save as much as I possibly can. I So these actually, um, I bought quite a bit of seeds about four years ago, and in those was uh, two packets of this rat-tailed radish, and I only had them growing in the garden box, which is hidden behind all of this. But since... Um, I've never saved the seeds, just every time I take out, when this dies kind of in the fall, early fall, I'll take it out and so this just keeps going from whatever was there the year before. Okay, so now list me a couple of plants that do that because I know rainbow chard is big chard on my list <laughs> for, I only have to get one packet and I've got chard for life. Yes. Rhubarb is one of those too, correct? Yes, absolutely. What else do you find that you really only need one packet of if you want um, Tomatoes. Absolutely, tomatoes are the easiest thing. Um, also, that's why I come to you for tomatoes because <laughs> I have a hard time with blight. So, and depending on the year, I've had some very good tomato years, but others have have some issues. Um, so, a lot of what I do now is, um, if I buy some produce in the store, I will save the seeds for that. So, um, you know, cantaloupe was the one I just did yesterday, so I'll be planting cantaloupe pretty soon. Um, that one seems to grow pretty easily as well. So very easy to save your cantaloupe seeds and then just get those going from scratch. So you find that's pretty consistent that you can grow, uh, they don't make them sterile in any way, shape or form. Oh no. No, okay. Abs absolutely, so, so easy to just to keep those producing fruit or vegetables, whatever you, you choose. Wonderful, okay, so cantaloupe and what else? Cantaloupe, um, tomatoes are a big one. 
Um, I try and just kind of spread those seeds so there's random tomatoes everywhere. Papaya is a very easy one to grow from seeds. So huh. just buy one papaya, there's literally hundreds of seeds inside of the papaya. And you know, I'll get a couple of different papaya trees out of those. Um, the gophers like those, so they have gotten my papaya trees. <laughs> you put a sacrificial papaya in the corner. Exactly. That sounds like a band, the sacrificial papayas. <laughs> um, cucumbers are usually pretty good for regrowing as well. Um, what about squash? Squash, absolutely. Absolutely squash. I don't often have to go get seeds for squash. <laughs> um, actually, pomegranate has been one that is very easy to, to regrow a tree out of. And granted, it's going to take a couple of years until you get um, actual produce out of that. However, it is a very easy plant to grow from the seeds of a pom pomegranate that you're buying or else you get from a friend. Um, the same is true of citrus. So um, your oranges, the lemons, the limes, and then also um, avocado, which is related to citrus too. So again, all those, those items, very easy to grow from seed. It'll be a couple of years until you're getting anything that, that comes off of that. However, really cool to see something that you grew from a seed and you know put some time and energy into. So, I do wanna ask you a couple of things. And again, with the victory garden thing, mm -hmm. because it kind of works into this. Mm -hmm. You're starting a new project now. It, You've been doing food sharing for years with us, mm -hmm. and it's sort of a casual, hey, I got a zucchini, you got a beet, we sort of go back and forth on that kind of thing. Yep. But now you're doing something that is a little more formal. Tell us about your idea. So it's called Extra Harvest Share, um, and it's really just about the extra fruits or vegetables or both that somebody has in their backyard. Um, I work up in Los Angeles and you know I'm down here in San Diego a lot too and I see in people's front yards a lot of extra citrus usually or avocados or extra uh, fruit trees and those the fruit is just falling to the ground. Um, and so this is really a way just to be able to come get that extra harvest and to share with those who would want it. And that can be you know, somebody that doesn't grow anything in their yard and just wants some local extra produce. Um, so yeah, I'm starting that up in, in this neighborhood right now, and it's really about just sharing what we're already growing, because um, there's there's plenty of bounty. <laughs> yeah. And so rather than having any of it go to waste, it's better to share. And it, it's really building a sense of community too, um, and getting to know who your neighbors are, um, getting to share and, and let them know what works best for all of us. Yeah, so. and, and you know, there, we do have a couple neighbors that, I mean, the down the street we have a couple that have these gorgeous citrus trees and I have asked them if they would mind if I if I if I could have a lemon or two and yeah. oh they're always happy to give it to me absolutely but I don't have I it's it's one thing to to do that it's another thing just to go swipe one in the middle of the <laughs> which can happen I've had that thought as well <laughs> yes but it's a really nice thing to formalize that so people can feel comfortable with it yeah. and it expands a social experience it's a sense of community that increases the bonds between neighbors and people People that are maybe shut-ins at home it's mm -hmm. a huge thing it's just a really interesting idea you have here for the longer term all those things you just said and for the shorter term while we are, we are dealing with the COVID-19 um, you know with the produce being off the shelves in our supermarkets and there's so much that's just right here that we can be sharing that's nutritious local healthy all of this is organic a lot of our neighbors are doing organic growing um, so we can just kind of you know, from a distance or six feet away, share some of our extras with, with other people who need it. Um, it's minimizing having to go to the supermarkets for some of those items, and you're getting things that likely are not in the supermarkets as well. So getting to see, um, you know, a bunch of chard or a rat-tailed radish that typically isn't in our supermarkets, but is very healthy and, and tasty too. So. Yeah, you brought us over, what, four or five lemons and some of these little, I don't know what those, are they some kumquats? kumquats yep. Is that and what they are? grapefruit. Mm -hmm. Kumquats and grapes is beautiful looking produce and it, it's, I don't know, where did you get that? So my, my brother um, is going to be participating in the program as well and um, you know he has a couple acres of land and him and his wife have, have um, over the past couple years put in over 30 different fruit trees. Wow. Um, and so also a big concept of this extra harvest share is seasonality as well. Um, and so right now is a big time for our citrus uh, fruits in San Diego County. Um, but then soon enough, we'll be having a lot of the stone fruits, like you mentioned. So the plums, the peaches, the nectarines, um, also cherries are going to be coming up. Um, guava will be coming up in a couple of months here as well. Avocados will be coming in a few months. So I really want to emphasize the seasonality and understand what is growing when in each of our gardens. So, 
yeah, my brother is, is going to be participating in this as well. He has so much overflow and is so happy to share. Um, I took around a few bags today and met some of the other neighbors and received so much positive feedback, like you just said too, of come on over, come pick it. It's, they love the idea. Yeah. Um, so just sharing all of those, the produce with other neighbors. Yeah, be, and this is the time when we need that bond, yes, I think. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's just a wonderful thing to increase awareness of each other, especially mm -hmm. since we've had some really positive things that have happened from this outbreak. Mm -hmm. I see people walking with their kids. Mm. I see, yeah. you know, I see people exercising. I, I, it's just, a, I see people working in their yards. It's, it's something that yeah. you're not used to, and it's a really sad yet joyous thing. It is. I think. And it's so simple. I mean, saying hello and waving to your neighbors and just letting them know, hey, I'm on this street and I'm right behind you or, you know, if there's anything you need. And it's it's really it's increasing that community bond, which yeah. I'm I'm really enjoying. Yeah. So now how do you how do you comfort people? Because let's face it, you are distributing food mm -hmm. and I know you're a careful gal, <laughs> um, but not everybody knows that when Agreed. you have something like this, you're sort of torn because you have to worry about precautions for as it is, we're standing 10 feet away yep. and we waved at you at the door mm -hmm. and that's only responsible thing to, to do. But when you hand food to somebody, even if they really need it, yeah. what are you doing to help them to, to, to feel better about the food they're receiving? That's a good question. Um, I've given that a lot of thought to and, you know, kind of taking in what we're being advised to do as well from the state and the, um, the nation levels also. Um, for right now, um, at least it's, it's just me doing this um, and I, I don't anticipate it doing that forever. I don't want that to be it, but to minimize the amount of hands touching things, um, I'm limiting it, limiting it just to myself. So, um, you know, I'm going into people's uh, yards and you know, just picking the produce myself. I'm wearing gloves. There's lots of hand washing, putting on the mask too, just to, just to minimize everything as much as possible. So at least when I'm going to the neighbors and sharing uh, bags of food with them, you know, I'm wearing the gloves still too when I'm going and, you know, I'm placing it on doorsteps and then people are able to come and get it at their leisure as well. So it's a very, um, you know, detached process as well. And I'm trying to minimize the number of people. Again, I don't want it to be that way forever. I want it to be more of a, a close bond that the community and, and volunteers are helping with too. But, but I'd say, you, you know, if, if you're looking for an intimate bond and there's nothing more intimate than food, you yes. ingest it. And so yeah. you, even if there's the distance to protect people when picking mm -hmm. and when distributing, mm -hmm. you, it is still a very, very, very intimate and close and helpful thing. Absolutely. I, I do know in relation to the food collection thing, there's something that has struck my mind because as you very well know, we put boxes in our front yard and I beg yes. my <laughs> growing neighbor across the street to come and make things grow in those piles because I can put the dirt in there, but the growing part is another step. Yep. And I've had many people come by and say, oh, that's beautiful lettuce, yep. which is compliments of you. You've made some gorgeous uh, lettuce contributions out there. And I am always happy, Rick and I have said, if anybody wants vegetables, come take them. Mm -hmm. You're welcome to it. Mm -hmm. But this is right by the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And now we have a lot of people walking through and if they want to take yes. food, they can. Yes. Do you think that that's a difficult thing too? And do you think maybe we just say to people, fair game in the front yard if you want it? Uh, it's, a, it's a really tough thing, isn't it? It's strengthening that community bond. So I would say all for it whoever wants some, help yourself. Um, it's part of the education process. Um, so I, you know, I'd like to be talking to people too of how easy things are to grow and how much, um, how much you want people to just come and take, but also feel free to, to put into that as well. So save some seeds from your cantaloupe and try putting those in, or hey, an extra garlic piece that is starting to have a little green shoot, go put that in. So just um, kind of the awareness. Um, I think a lot of people, also, this is just a theory, don't entirely know how to garden or don't have the confidence with it. Um, and a lot of people kind of don't know what things look like growing as well. Um, zucchinis, for example, you have a beautiful zucchini patch in those boxes. Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, having people dig around beneath the leaves and part the leaves and everything, you know, I just don't, I wouldn't think that most people would know that's how a zucchini grows. Yes. Um, so, you know, I tried putting little signs in that garden box too of like organic non-GMO lettuce. Um, there's peppers in there. Um, there are cucumbers that hopefully come up soon, but 
um, but just the, the education portion of it. But I would say, yes, fair game for anyone, but I would want people to um, kind of be disarmed a bit as well and to realize that they can take as much as they want, but also just to, to think about how they can contribute as well. So kind of a give and get type of atmosphere. Well, I know that I, they contribute to me a really nice sense of happiness because yeah. I look at people and I listen to them in my front windows and you say, oh, look at yeah. that zucchini. I can hear them as they walk by. And, yep. and I, I just get such a happy glow that people are enjoying things that they otherwise might not want to enjoy. Yeah. And I really like the fact that the kids in the neighborhood say, yeah. ooh, that's neat. I want to grow a pumpkin because we had that big monster 30-pound <laughs> pumpkin in my front yard yep. <laughs> last year. And that was a volunteer. Mm -hmm. So it really brings a sense of joy that they get something less quantifiable, sort yeah. of a conceptual yeah. idea. Absolutely. That's a really nice feeling. So the one thing that you mentioned was that it, some people find it's very difficult. Maybe they, they, they're threatened by things. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of older gentlemen on this street mm -hmm. that grew up in that World War II era mm -hmm. of the Victory Garden, and they are phenomenal gardeners. I, I bet. <laughs> and... I wonder if, the, do you think that that's a generational thing, that they just grew up with that so they do it? Or do you think that this is something that people just have to be educated on and they'll realize that anybody can do it? I, I think it's a little bit of both of those things, actually. Um, I think most of it is about the awareness and the education. And, you know, during the war, which was a terrible time for, for most, um, just learning how to be more self-sufficient and to be less reliant on... Uh, systems that are in place, which we're kind of seeing now as well. Um, I don't think we as a society have had to do that in my lifetime. Um, I don't think we've had to do that in recent years or anything. Um, so I just don't, I don't think the, the majority in generalization, the majority of people um, want to put in the time for that or the energy to into their gardens. I think it's very easy for us, especially us in San Diego, to go two minutes away to our locally grocery, local grocery store and just pick out whatever you want for that night. Um, and anything in any season as well. So I just don't think that the education has been there as strong as possible, um, nor the, the necessity. And so I kind of hope that maybe during this time, as we have a bit of time to breathe and relax and, you know, enjoy the things around us and our families, um, we're kind of getting back to that. And, you know, if, if I, I'm sure you guys feel the same way, can help with any gardening tips or just showing people um, how things grow, what grows best when, um, I, I think we're all the better for it. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2020.